Okay, so now we are recording. So welcome everyone tonight to prevent the spread of invasive species, best practices for hikers and bikers, and specifically fall hikers and bikers, because we have some very specific seasonal tips for you all. Um, this is a workshop uh, hosted and presented by the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, for which I and Becca are employees of. Next one. And then just a general overview um, so that we know where we're going tonight. We'll be doing some basic introductions of ourselves, our program, um, but also the concept of invasive species in general. We'll be jumping into prevention pathways in terms of hiking and biking and recreating in the outdoors in the Adirondacks this fall. We'll jump into after that species to be aware of, so plants and then animals, then ways to take action. Um, I emailed out some very specific details about um, downloading and making an account with IMAP Invasives. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I'm also gonna direct you to a recorded workshop we had earlier in July, so that you can take a deeper dive yourself. And then we have some time at the very end um, for 10 minutes of questions and answers. However, if we, you know, we go too long, we can answer more questions in depth um, and stay a little bit later. Um, and if, if there are no questions, then we'll say good night. So part one, introductions, who am I? And who is Becca? And what is the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program? Uh, my name is Emily Bell Dinan. I am the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, or APIPS, Education and Outreach Coordinator. So you may have come to some of our workshops this past summer or in the spring with the Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, and I am in charge of creating a lot of our education programs or outreach. So you might see emails from me or posts on Facebook. Um, and then in the future, we'll be building up a lot more of our volunteer programs. Um, I have my email here and Becca has her email here as well because we're a resource for you. Um, if you need to email us about what kind of crazy plant you saw out in the world, if you have questions about how to get this type of information to other groups you work with. Um, I'm, Becca, do you want me to just jump in and give you an, your introduction or do you wanna do it? I'll do it, okay. So this is Becca Bernacki. She's amazing. Uh, she is a PIPS Terrestrial Invasive Species Project Coordinator. So Becca actually is the recipient of many emails with the question, what is this plant? Um, and so we're here to serve you, but Becca does a lot from managing um, lots of plant data, invasive species data, to also uh, managing crews who actively manage different sites, and then works with me on different types of education outreach in order to get to people to prevent the spread and introduction of invasive species in the first place. Um, so I said we were responsible for our community here. Um, everyone can see my screen, is that correct? So I'm outlining um, our prism geography here, and I'll get into what a prism is in just a second. So we serve everything within the blue line of Adirondack Park up until Lake Champlain and to our great neighbors to the north. But we're only one of eight different um, prisms, or what they say, a partnership for regional invasive species management. Wait, I'm gonna add someone else to our room. Um, and all of these eight different prisms serve different geographies throughout New York State because different plants are impacting different ecosystems. Oh, is everybody on mute? Okay, great. Um, and all of the prisms are funded by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Our prism happens to be housed and co-managed within the Nature Conservancy. So we do a lot of different things. Um, but our ultimate goal is to prevent new introductions of invasive species to the Adirondacks. We do that in many different ways. And part of it is also making sure people know how to do that. So prevent the spread um, through human behaviors. We also rapidly detect and eradicate new infestations. So if something is small in population, we have the ability to go out and control it very quick, quickly or take a rapid response approach to controlling that spread. We also manage existing priority infestations um, in order to mitigate impacts. We might not be able to fully eradicate a species, but in order to reduce its harm on the local ecosystem or economic activities, we're able to manage priority infestations. 
We have a terrestrial species program, and so that's what Becca ma manages. We also work with uh, a lot of lake associations and uh, a number of different partnership uh, partners throughout the region on our aquatic invasive species programs in our lakes, in our rivers, in our wetlands, and then education outreach, which I've talked about a little bit. But if you are zooming in from another geography and you're not in the Adirondacks, that's quite all right. We've been able to reach more people throughout New York State now more than ever, um, funnily enough, with Zoom. And so part of the outreach I'll do after this and following up is to connect you to the other prisms that you might be in the geography of, and also ways to get on our listserv to stay in the loop. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Becca and feel free to take over the screen or tell me to move the slides. I am just requesting remote control right now, and then I will take over. Great. So thank you, Emily, for that great introduction. You're welcome. Um, we're going to jump in and start talking about what are invasive species. So I am sure that everyone has heard this word before. Um, what does invasive mean? So we typically think of invasive species as non-native species or species that were brought here from somewhere else that cause either economic, social, or human, or ecological harm. Um, so that's kind of a mouthful, right? What does that really mean? So a non-native species is a species that was brought here from somewhere else. Um, and these species, you know, aren't always bad. I mean, sometimes you, you might bring a, a, a flower over and it, it doesn't really leave your flower garden and, you know, it, it requires, you know, human input to, to stay and thrive. The invasive species are, are those that kind of exceed those bounds. So, you know, the seed might be able to be dispersed from your garden into, you know, another area and that species thrives and, and causes harm in one of these three ways we talked about. So one way uh, invasive species can cause economic harm uh, is that some of these species are, are very robust and they can grow into your, the foundation of your house. You know, that's a great example of economic harm. Um, I'm sure folks have heard of giant hogweed and that's an invasive species that can cause human health harm. You get the sap of that species on your skin, you can get a burn and that burn will be uh, visible and, and cause you some problems for the next few years when it's exposed to sunlight. And, and the big one that we, we really talk and think a lot about are ecological harm. Invasive species tend to outcompete native species and, and lead to ecological harm and monocultures and all sorts of bad things that we don't want happening in our ecosystems. Uh, we have at the bottom kind of this, this slide of invasive species, nuisance species, and non-native species. And I talked a little bit about that a second ago. But it's important to remember that invasive species are the result of human activity. None of these species are spreading on their own. Um, these are all spread via human activity from one continent to another or one area of the continent to another. There are species in the Midwest that are native there that are invasive here and vice versa. So it's important to think about that context of how invasive species are spread, and also, you know, kind of that species exist on this, this plane, you know, with non-native and nuisances and invasive species. Um, this is a kind of outdated way of looking at things, but uh, we used to believe that of 100 species that were brought from another continent to our continent, 10 would be able to survive without human inter in, uh, intervention, and one of those 100 species would become invasive. So that's kind of a good way to look at it, even though it is a little outdated. So why are some non-native species invasive? So when we bring a new species here, it often lacks its native predators, parasites, and climate controls. So all those things that naturally control the species and kept it from becoming invasive in its native lands are gone now, so it can spread rapidly without those pressures. Oftentimes, these species produce new seeds or offspring, you look at that photo on the top left, that's a purple loose stripe, and you can just see the massive amounts of seeds that are present in that species. One purple loose stripe plant can produce up to 2.7 million seeds, so you can see how quickly a species like that can spread. A lot of these species also can successfully reproduce via multiple, multiple means. So a great uh, example of this is the Phragmites, which is down the bottom right, um, that can via seeds, but the big way this species reproduces, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is via its roots. Um, so the roots extend laterally um, below the plant and can kind of create 
new plants coming up from those root systems as it grows out. And also if that root system is fragmented, so if you were to break it up when you're digging or you know, some heavy equipment was in there, each of those fragments can also produce a new Phrygmites plant. These species um, are also usually generalists, so they don't have very specific climate or resource um, requirements, so they can grow just about anywhere. And they really thrive in disturbed sites. So if the site becomes disturbed, they can usually get in there and reproduce very quickly and outcompete the native species. Um, and as a result, they're monopolizing those resources so that the native species can't get them. So I touched on this before a little bit, so we're gonna get into it more now, are the ecological impacts of invasive species. The big ecological threat that we think about is, is species loss of our native species. So um, if you look back at that previous slide in that bottom right where we had the Phragmites, we could see it's a very, I'm gonna move back here, it's a very dense monoculture of Phragmites, nothing else is growing there. Um, it's out competing all the native plants, and you know shifting the conditions there so that you know native species aren't successful anymore. Um, species losses can also occur through predation and parasitism. We'll talk about this a little bit uh, later when we get into invasive forest pests that are uh, hurting our, our native tree species. It can also cause habitat changes. Um, if, you know as I touched on with those monocultures if there was a native, you know, wetland edge, you'd see a big variety of species and, you know, lots of animals using those habitats. Uh, animals like a heterozygous environment. They like multiple layers. Obviously, there's only one layer there. We don't have herbaceous plants and little shrubs in that Phragmites patch. Uh, uh, invasive species decrease climate resiliency. So, um, obviously, as you have fewer and fewer species in an area, as a result of the monocultures, there's less resiliency. It's easier to knock down that, that system. There's water quality impacts. A lot of these, these dense monocultures on the edge of streams especially um, aren't as great, good at stabilizing the soils as our native species. So if a flood event comes through, um, you can see big washouts oftentimes and increased turbidity in the soils. There's also an increase in fire risk associated with invasive species. So what are the economic and social impacts? It's estimated that invasive species cost the US economy $137 to $146 billion annually. These, th th those numbers are, are mind blowing. Um, one of the ways that invasive species impact our economy are through decreases in recreation and tourism. If you were an angler or someone wanting to go kayak or canoe on you know, a stream and you had a, you know, drag your stuff and all your equipment through that Phragmites, you probably wouldn't be as willing to go do it as you would if you could walk right up and, and get right in that, that river and, and go, go do what you want to do. Uh, there's also reduced pop property values if that Phragmites stand was on your property. You know, it's not as pretty, it's not as, as usable as a native ecosystem there. There are also human health impacts. Um, algal blooms, dead zones, rashes, fire risk, an increased tick population. So I touched on giant hogweed and how it can cause a chemical burn on your skin. There's another species called uh, Japanese barberry and mites and small rodents really love Japanese barberry. So we see increases in tick populations as a result of invasive species. A few other ways that invasive species impact our societal and economy are through drinking water quality. So we talked a little bit a second ago about turbidity. Um, and that also impacts our, our flood control impacts. Uh, I did touch on a, again a bit a second ago about structural damage. You know, some of these, these species are, are very, very aggressive and they can grow through foundations, they can grow through uh, roadways, they can grow through all sorts of things and cause structural damage to our infrastructure. <laughs> Sorry, folks, who oh. want to advance for me. There we go, I'm gonna pass the baton back to Emily. Thank you, Becca. So tonight we're gonna, we're gonna, as I mentioned, we're gonna ping pong back and forth in order to keep you awake, because it is the evening and it is getting later in, in, in the fall, so the sun is not up as long anymore. So um, thank you so much for talking about all of the incredible impacts that 
invasive species, plant and animal can have on our natural ecosystem, on our natural environment, on our built environment, on human health, um, on in infrastructure, and really, what we keep talking about at APIP and in our messages are, oh wait, I think you're still controlling the screen, Becca. How do I, oh, I think I've taken, have I taken it back? Yes. Okay. Oh wait. Oh, okay, good. I'm sorry. Thank you everyone for your patience. We're learning. It's a year of learning. Um, so, you know, the most affordable way to prevent a problem, it's like going to the doctor. Preventative medicine, is you know it takes it might take the most work but you're going to avoid the most costly procedures in the end you're going to maintain uh, homeostasis most productively in the end um, and you're going to remain as healthy and happy as possible by going to the doctor so in terms of preventative medicine for our local ecosystems in our in our prism geography we promote preventative strategies um, so let's break those pathways of spread that invasive animals and plants are coming to any geography really. Um, and let's think about what those pathways are in order to kind of break the chain. So Becca touched on it many, many times. Um, if we have raised hands right now, does that mean we have questions? Are there any questions in the chat right now? No, we're good. Okay, great. Um, so breaking those pathways of spread because a lot of these plants can't move on their own. You know, they're moving by, by human activity. And these insects, even though they, you know, are ambulatory, a lot of insects can't travel more that we're thinking of in this instance. Forget about monarch butterflies that can travel continent to continent. Um, but some of these insects that are, are of a big forest risk to the Adirondacks, they can't move more than five city blocks on their own. So they're getting moved through human activity. So we've got Smokey the bear who advocates for everything in our forest. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, and so it really, it really comes down to human activity and what people are doing to move invasive species. And there's a many, many different ways that invasives are moved across the globe, across the state, across the country, across the continent, um, even across our prism, even across Adirondack Park. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those things tonight. We're not going to talk about other things tonight, but we still have resources about those topics that we're not talking about tonight. So transit is a really big uh, factor in terms of transporting invasive species, uh, but we're not going to talk about it tonight. Uh, global and domestic trade is another massive way um, in which invasive species are spread across the continent, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. Um, in terms of aquatic invasive species, boating and recreation, angler gear um, is, is a huge issue to be aware of and control and always clean your gear. Um, we have basically contact tracing for aquatic invasive species across the, across the Northeast to know where different species are coming from. Um, we have a lot of aquatic invasive trainings that are also recorded that I'll sh share out with everyone. If you want to go educate yourselves on how to keep aquatic invasives out of the Adirondacks. And so tonight we're going to talk about hiking. We're going to talk about bikes. Um, I would, as a bicyclist, I would absolutely recommend not leaving your bicycle in this sort of condition. Um, you will have to replace all your gears and your chain very quickly if so. And those are probably nice pedals, so don't do that. Um, invasives are spread on pets as well. And these are my pets. And I could do a better job <laughs> brushing them when they're covered in seeds myself. Gear is a really big part of it. Um, New York is a very unfortunate case study in uh, someone who loved the outdoors and loved wildlife as a photographer coming to photograph bats. They didn't realize when they came um, to outside of Albany to go spelunking and take photographs of bats that they were introducing white nose fungus on their camping gear, on their boots. Um, and so this is something to really pay attention to as well. Firewood, we're going to discuss firewood. It's a, um, this firewood is untreated lumber and untreated lumber means that it has not been, um, you know, put in a kiln or treated with insecticide or treated with formaldehyde or treated with fungicide. Um, you don't want to burn wood that has been treated, which is very, very important to remember. Um, but also you don't want to transport untreated lumber because you don't want to 
transport insects that might be on in untreated lumber. Um, and we're gonna talk about um, trail etiquette. And just always a reminder of trail etiquette because trail etiquette's also changed a lot this year um, with issues surrounding COVID-19 and tourism increasing in the Adirondacks. This poor woman is so happy and she has no idea that I'm using her as an example. So I feel bad, but we're gonna talk about trail etiquette. One moment. So in terms of hiking and biking and gear and firewood, how are these things getting spread and in, in what modes? Um, so in terms of soil and mud, um, caked on your boots, caked on your bike, caked on your tires, or in your tent. So I know just about everyone shakes out their tent before they pack it up um, to get a lot of the soil out of their tent. But how many people are making sure their gear is cleaned again when they get home? Um, not often unless you get a downpour and you have to dry everything intensely, right? That's when you really pay attention to making sure your gear is super clean when you pack it up um, in order for it to be ready for when you pack it out again. But in that soil, in that mud, um, it's, it's incredibly difficult to exclude any of the seeds that are in that soil and any in, invertebrate um, eggs or larva that might be in that soil. So larva, is not such a big deal, but eggs can be. Um, especially, we're going to talk a little about in invasive jumping worms at the end, and so, at, or in our species discussion tonight. So, you know, worm egg casings can survive a very long time through very difficult um, environments. Um, it, they can even be digested in some cases and pass through a system of another animal and stomach acid and make it through. The same with many, many different types of seed coats. So seeds are really, really tough in order to protect, you know, genetic material of plants and future generations of plants. And they've evolved to be incredibly tough, you know, cookies to crack. And so if they're caked on mud in, on your gear, you will inadvertently bring it to another place. Um, that being said, we're going to talk a little bit tonight. We're going to highlight species that are going to seed this fall. And so and that are prolific seed producers, and Becca touched on it a little bit before, where purple loosestrife, one plant, can produce two million seeds, which is insane. Um, it's a huge number to think about. And so if you are walking through a purple loosestrife patch this fall, and you're picking up seeds, and you're not cleaning your boots, and you're going on another hike, because you want to do all 46 peaks, um, you might be bringing something with you. So keep your, your gear clean. Um, that being said, not a lot of people will keep, in my experience, you, you can't, physically can't keep your bike this dirty. Um, I have, and I've paid the price. I also used to live by the ocean, and so cleaning our bikes became a really big deal because salt will kill your bike. But um, people do keep their ATVs this way. People do keep uh, their trucks this way. People um, might not be paying attention unless it's going to eat away at your gears. We talked a little bit about, oh, we have another person coming in. Hold on. We talked a little bit about firewood, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it in just a second. But untreated wood is where insects can thrive. Um, and this summer, if you've been paying attention to some of the news, our area is having more introductions of two very or two very devastating types of uh, invasive insects that can be carried on firewood and in particular emerald ash borer is very prevalent throughout other parts of the state in the northeast and it's something we really want to control and limit the spread of and that's primarily through firewood and then informal trails we're going to talk about informal trails a bit um, stay on the trail rules are meant to be followed um, we're going to talk about erosion issues. We're going to talk about, you know, if your feet are carrying, even if your boots are clean, they're probably not clean enough. Um, and that's okay, no judgment. But if you're going off trail, um, in particular, if you're trying to avoid other hikers on the trail because people haven't been carrying masks, for instance, um, you're going to be stepping off trail. And so you're going to bring everything with it, um, including compaction of soil, um, potential 
compaction of you know spring ephemerals that we're not seeing in the fall because they've died back for the year um, but the same goes for keeping pets on trail um, it's just polite trail etiquette but they're also bringing things with them um, and we're going to talk a, a lot about not making new trails or cheater trails which i think is kind of a judgy way to call it but maybe maybe that's okay um, for when you're biking so staying within you know a single track system while mountain biking it's all about adapting behavior so preventing the spread is really changing our behaviors uh, people didn't recycle for instance, once upon a time, and I know recycling is a controversial topic, um, but when I was one, you know, people really didn't recycle before the mid nineties and people are still aren't recycling that great, but you know, we, we've still changed human behaviors. People weren't always composting and now they're composting because they're changing behaviors. Heck, people didn't used to have seat belts in their cars and we've changed that through human behavior. So we can change behaviors in order to have a positive outcome impact or really a leave no trace approach to invasive species coming off the trail um, and you're doing this tonight if you're in this workshop you're doing great um, one of the top things to do in terms of changing your behaviors and adapting behaviors and being a good steward on the trail is to know your surroundings and really start learning your plants it's not easy but it's it's doable and there's a lot of plants people do know um, and it's a lifelong hobby. It's a lifelong learning journey. But if you know what invasive species to look for, you can help prevent their spread. So you can report it. And we're going to talk about reporting. Um, but you can also avoid walking through it. You can also help control it if it's really small or if it's on your own property. If you know it's invasive because you've been learning your plants, um, you can start controlling it or even talking to others. And part of knowing your plants is also just paying attention and being aware of what type of habitat you're in. So what you're going to be looking for on a lake shore is very different than what's going to be in a very shady forest habitat. Um, what you're going to be looking for in a wetland is very different than what's in an alpine habitat on a high peak. So paying attention to your plants and paying attention to your habitat, um, it all helps with identification, which helps with understanding how to prevent the spread. Firewood. Um, a lot of insects have been moving via firewood. And I know I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'll keep going on this. Um, the don't move firewood messaging has been around for a while, probably 20 years. And we're wondering if people are still paying attention. So we're just trying to ring that bell again and say, don't move firewood, burn it where you buy it. Um, it is state regulation in New York to not move firewood more than 50 miles, but you can always do better than that. It's hard to throw a rock in the Adirondacks and not see a DIY firewood stand like this. So you can buy wood as close to your campground, as close to your trailhead, um, as close to home as you can. And when you do, take a look at it. So are you seeing insect activity? Um, Becca's going to get into, you know, worm and larvae behavior in ash trees. Excuse me. It's really hard to identify what type of tree your firewood came from, but it's not that hard to not move it more than 50 miles. So we're trying to advocate for moving it a lot less distance in the Adirondacks. And then stay on the trail. These folks are not on the trail. Please stay on the trail. <laughs> Um, I mentioned bushwhacking is going to impact, you know, what seeds are introduced off trail. It's going to increase um, compaction, which is really bad for soil and soil organisms. Um, but don't avoid mud by making your own trail, you know, like pay attention to conditions before and after a rain. Um, if it has been pouring out, you probably want to go hit like a, a south facing trail because it will dry up faster. Um, but you might have to, you know, we're talking about keeping your boots clean, but that's before you get to the trail. When you're on the trail, you can get as dirty as you need to get. And then when you get off the trail, clean it off again. Because if there were invasives on the trail and you were trying to not avoid a mud puddle, you might be bringing invasives off the trail again with you. So on the trail, don't avoid mud. Off the trail, keep your boots clean. 
adhere to closures. So there have been a lot of parking closures, trail closures, um, and there always are of if there's rock slides or over overuse of a trail or um, wildlife observations, you know, uh, Becca introduced me to the phrase of poaching trail. So don't poach a trail. If it's closed, it's closed for a reason. So please avoid it um, and please pay attention. And also please wear a mask and please social distance because um, if you wear a mask, you don't necessarily have to go bushwhack in order to stay safe. Um, and again, look for south facing trails following wet, wet weather because they'll probably dry up faster. And then adopting behavior. So some of our trails in the Adirondacks, um, some of the nature conservancies preserves now further east closer to Lake Champlain, we're starting to build boot brush stations. So that's pictured here. And that's part of the Play Glee, Clean Go campaign. So if there is a boot brush station at a trailhead, or if you're a volunteer that works with a different conservation group, and you don't have a boot brush station, this is a really easy thing to build. Um, you can have sign to talk to people about why it's there, to encourage its use, to talk about different invasives. Um, but it's just a really easy way to make sure everybody's cleaning their boots. The other thing you can do is, believe it or not, this is, um, this is just from Chewy.com, and I am not promoting any website or pet store over another, but this is something in terms of adapting behaviors. This is something you should try to include when you go on a day hike, when you go backpacking, when you go car camping. Um, it's a simple handheld boot brush. They're probably about this long, and they're actually used in the rest of the world, not the boot brush world, to clean horse hooves. So it's just a small brush and a pick. And it, people keep their horse's feet pretty clean if they're good horse owners, because uh, horse's feet rot really easily, which is sad. Um, but make sure you know, you're carrying a granola bar, you're carrying water, you're carrying a headlamp, uh, you're carrying a map, carry this handheld boot brush. You can order it online. I can send out links. You can get it from uh, a, you know, a farm and feed store, you can get it from a pet store. Um, they're maybe about $8 at the most. It's really important um, to just keep your boots clean and have the tools you need to do so. Keep your pets clean. This is not my pet, but he is adorable um, and he is really dirty. So keep your pets clean um, as much as possible. I know it's hard. My dogs are always disgusting, but keep your pets clean and keep them on, on the trail on leash with you. It's about boot brushes, but also if it needs to be said, it needs to be said for pet waste, pack it in, pack it out because their waste also contains seeds. Um, and seeds can be digested and released and be safe and germinate afterwards. So pack it in, pack it out. A little note about parking. So parking has been a controversial topic in the Adirondack High Peaks region this summer um, because Parking has been very limited with a higher rate of visitorship than we've ever seen. Um, so people are making impromptu parking areas. I moved up here from out west where um, in very popular areas, I was not in California, but in very popular areas of California, people will line the highways and impromptu parking. And parking areas, and Becca mentioned this about disturbed areas, are kind of hotbeds for invasive species and in the Adirondacks this is very true as well. So we have a lot of ditching and drainage that is pushed into uh, the sides of the road in order to keep water off the roadway and with that artificial amount of water in every drainage ditch on the road you kind of end up with an accidental wetland um, but the seeds that get planted there or get moved um, are typically very, very robust plants, and we get a lot of purple loosestrife in um, drainage ditches. We get a lot of Phragmites in drainage ditches. Um, another plant we're not going to talk about today, but is common, is uh, yellow flag iris gets, you know, grows in drainage ditches. And so when you're parking your car there, you're also probably picking up invasive species, or when you get out of the car, you're picking it up on your feet. So just be aware when you learn your plants, you can be aware of that. When you're learning what habitat you're in, you could be aware of that too. And so just think about where you're parking. So that goes into being on the lookout. And we're going to talk a little bit about IMAP invasives at the end of tonight. I emailed you all some information about IMAP invasives and using this as a primary reporting tool 
Um, it's really important citizen science that's occurring. Um, we'll talk more about it, but I can't emphasize the use of IMAP invasives enough. It's a great way for you to be an amazing steward and citizen scientist out on the trail. So let's talk about biking. Some of this is the same. Know your plants, start learning your plants. Plants are great, learn more about them. And we'll help you, we'll help you do that. Pay attention to your habitat. And know before you go. So here's where it gets more detailed into biking. Um, Becky and I were chatting as people were coming into the waiting room. I love fat tire biking. I started doing it out in Oregon. Uh, I live near trails here in, in the Adirondacks. Um, it's, it's fun, it's really great, and we don't want anybody to love the outdoors as much as they do, but also hurt the outdoors while they recreate. Pay attention, our trails open. Um, I'll send out some websites that talk about trail closures and where to find biking trails in the Adirondacks. Not every trail is for bikes. Um, it's, it's limited, uh, and that's, you know, sometimes just multi-user environments with mountain bikes can be very, very dangerous. So it's good to keep them limited. Um, and you can have more fun on your bike that way too. Um, but it also has to do with use. So if a trail is too muddy, it will be closed. And so it's closed for a reason. Please don't poach the trails if the trails are closed. Um, adhere to closures um, and keep single track single. Um, this goes into that leave no trace behavior where um, if you're not familiar with single track is, a lot of mountain bike parks, when the trail systems are developed, they're one direction. Because if they're not all going in the same direction, people could get really hurt and we don't want to do that. We want to have fun while we're biking. But they're often, you know, they're not tandem. They're, it's not like a rail trail where you can have two to three bikes next to each other and still room for folks walking there. Um, they're a single file bike system. So that's what we mean by single track. Um, so avoid riding when wet and muddy. So a little different than hiking where you shouldn't avoid mud puddles, you should just go for it. Um, so as to not make more, more trails, more side trails, um, avoid, just avoid riding when wet and muddy in general. And so talking with Becca, I've become aware, because I'm moving from a very rainy place in Oregon, where if you tried to avoid wet environments, you would never go outside ever again. But up here, where our soil's really deep, and our snow is really um, intense and melts for a long time, and we have a mud season, a lot of bike parks do adhere to being closed for mud season. And that is because, in talking about, you know, all the seeds on our gear, all the seeds on our shoes, all the seeds on our bikes, um, no matter how clean they are, they're probably still, they probably still have plants on them. Um, and they probably still have seeds on them because we live out in the woods up here. Um, there's plants everywhere. Um, so when it's really wet, you're digging deeper into the soil when your bike goes through. And when you're digging deeper into the soil, you're helping with erosion, you're helping remove topsoil, but also you're planting, you're literally planting seeds deeper into the soil seed bank. So we want to avoid that. Um, if you're riding outside of your ability, right, if you're trying to be, if you're trying to move from green to blue, for instance, um, and, and move up, right, in terms of skill level, don't avoid obstacles. Um, ride or walk over them rather than make that second trail. Don't make a side trail. Keep single track single. Ride within your ability. Um, Try to avoid puddles, um, so do avoid wet areas, and do try to go to those south-facing trails if you can. Um, but it's all going back to that, don't make informal trails, don't widen trails, and don't make cheater trails. So if you're trying to avoid an obstacle, um, you're cheating, so don't cheat. Um, the same with bushwhacking, don't do it, you're cheating, and you don't wanna hurt the forests around you. Um, so this photo is from Moab, which is a big biking epicenter. Um, and you see this more out west where if you're in a grassland or a desert, you don't see trees. So you don't see obstacles. So it doesn't make sense that you wouldn't just bike wherever you want. So this issue becomes really, really important when 
um, you're in an, a rocky area where you're say high up in the Alpine and you're coming off of the trail, um, even if you don't see trees blocking your way, there is a trail. So please stay on the trail if you're biking or hiking. And then getting to those adapting your behaviors for a bicyclist. Um, as I've mentioned, I am new here, so I'm not sure if any of our bike parks have a bike wash station like this, but this is exactly why joining a bike stewardship group. Um, I know here there's the betas where I was living, it was called the newts. So joining a bike stewardship group is a really big fun part about like making awesome stations like this that are really great infrastructure to keep the trail safe for everybody and keep the forest healthy for everybody. So practice your play clean glow, go while you're hiking, but also while you're biking. Clean your gear, clean your shoes, and clean your bike before and after you ride. Pack it in, pack it out. Keep an empty pocket in your jersey or your shorts or your jacket or your whatever um, for your trash. Um, I just always wanna move that message along. Practice, leave no trace. The same issues relate to parking. So parking can be really limited. Make sure, you know, use, you're learning your plants, you're learning your habitat, so make sure there's no poor blue stripe where you're parking. So that goes to roadsides and ditches, or if you're a road biker, you're often on the shoulder. And so if you are taking a stop, if you are taking a break in your road biking, make sure you're paying attention to what you're you know, taking a break in. Is it purple loosestrife? Is it uh, another invasive plant? So um, be aware if you're on a road bike as well. Gonna go back into IMAP invasives in just a little bit. And this is a great way to protect all of our habitats using citizen science. Join a stewardship crew. So I'll send out links about different bike resources up here, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know about these bike groups already. So I'm gonna pass it back to Becca. I'm gonna go on mute. Oh, but, but if you wanna ask, oh, you're controlling, oh good. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna start off by talking about three invasive plant species that go to seed in the fall. The first species is common reed grass, which is also known as Phragmites, and probably what you'll hear me refer to it uh, to throughout this presentation. The second is purple loosestrife. Uh, these two species are both fall seed producers, and humans are great vectors of spread for these seeds. The third species we're going to talk about is tree of heaven, and that also goes to seed in the fall. Um, humans aren't as big of a seed vec spread vector. Um, we'll get into it a little bit later, but the seeds from Tree of Heaven tend to spread via wind, but it's a great species to be on the lookout for. And if you see it, report it. So the first species we're gonna talk about is Phragmites. Phragmites is a perennial grass, and it ranges in height from three to 15 feet high. So it's pretty tall, pretty dense. Uh, you've probably seen it driving around, especially if you've been up the north way, it's pretty common on the north way. So how do we identify Phragmites other than this big, tall, giant grass? Uh, one thing you can look for is the ligule, which is where the leaf attaches to the stem. And the ligule on Phragmites is hairy. So you can see those little tufts of hair on that picture in the left, and that's a fairly diagnostic trait of the species. Another thing you can look for, especially as we're getting into the fall, is this stiff, sharp um, plume at the top of the plant. So, or I'm sorry, the stiff, sharp leaves and the large feathery flower plume at the top of the plant. There we go. Um, these flower plumes generally start out as a purple brown color, as you can see in this picture. And as we transition into the fall, they turn more of a tan gray. And that flower plume usually stays throughout the fall. But like most grasses, it's a pretty prolific seed producer. And you can just imagine how many seeds are within that, that flower head. So how does common reed grass or Phragmites spread? So I talked a little bit earlier about how the species has a very expansive lateral root system and can spread via that root system as those roots extend outward and more Phragmites can grow up from it. We also talked about how Phragmites can spread via fragmentation. If those roots are broken up and just a little piece of Phragmites is left behind, uh, that little fragment of root can produce a new Phragmites plant and also are the airborne seeds. So we looked at that flower head with its numerous seeds. Um, those seeds can fall onto the ground and if you were to hike through 
some Phragmites on the shoulder of the road before you went hiking and got Phragmites seeds into your, your boots and, and you hike a mile down into the trail. You know, the species is fairly common in the front, front country or along our roads, but it's very rare to find it in the back country and we want to keep it that way. Um, so it's really important to, to pay attention to where you're stepping when you get out of your car before you jump onto the trail itself. The next species we're going to talk about is purple loosestripe. Uh, purple loosestripe is a herbaceous perennial and it ranges in height from three to seven feet. How do we identify purple loosestripe? So when I'm looking for purple loosestripe, the first thing I kind of look for are these deep green, la simple lance-shaped leaves with smooth edges. And if I see those, the next thing I do is I go grab the stem of the plant and I kind of roll it between my fingers. So purple loosestripe has a very uh, distinctive stem which we'll get into, we'll, we'll flip back and forth here, that is square or many ankled. So it won't roll like a pencil well in your fingers. It's, it's pretty square and angular. Um, and that stem becomes increasingly woody in the summer. Um, jumping back for a second, those simple leaves are often opposite from each other. So they're directly across each other on that square stem or they can be arranged in whorls, so they kind of are in a circle. And usually there's a circle of three, as you can see in this picture right here. So it's kind of the, the prettiest part of purple loosestripe and why, why people brought it here originally is it has this really gorgeous showy flower spike um, that has many closely attached flowers. Um, so you can see that each of those little flowers on there, so that flower spike has many of them, has five to seven petals. Um, the color of these flowers is pretty variable. They can range from a bright pink to a deep dark purple. And then they generally flower from July until late September. And how purple loosestripe spread? You can see just how, how invasive purple loosestripe is in this picture. And the only way this species spreads is via seeds. We've talked before about how one plant can produce up to 2.7 million tiny, tiny seeds. So not only are the does it produce a lot of seeds? These seeds can germinate the next year or, um, and kind of the downside, these seeds remain dormant in the sort of seed bank for quite a while. So um, you might be stepping through a deep muddy area and not even know there's, there's purple loose strip there um, and, and spreading it. Uh, this is another species, as Emily mentioned, that's pretty common on our roadside ditches. So just like the, the Phragmites, you wanna be careful where you're, you're walking, you know, if you, park for your hike on the shoulder of the road and you're walking down in the ditch and you get purple loose stripe all over your, your, your boots and then you take it into the back country, you know, that'd be pretty unfortunate. The species, you know, just like common reed grass or phragmites is very common in the front country, um, but very rarely do we find it in the back country. So the third species we're gonna talk about is tree of heaven. And unlike the other two species, um, seeds being transported by human aren't the big spread factor here. The species does, do, does go to seed and fall, so we figured we'd include it here to talk about something a little bit different. Tree of Heaven is a deciduous tree and it can grow up to 80 feet tall. Um, it's kind of got this cool looking bark. Um, so the bark it starts out as smooth and green when the, the tree is very young. But as the tree ages, it turns light brown and gray and kind of develops this, this interesting texture that is very cantaloupe-like. Um, so that's a great trait to look for when you're trying to identify tree of heaven. Um, so identifying the leaves, the leaves are compound as opposed to simple. So you can think of you know, a maple leaf compared to an ash leaf here. So it's a, a compound leaf is a, a leaf made up of multiple leaflets. These compound leaves on Tree of Heaven can range in size from one to four feet. So they're pretty, pretty big. And they can have between 10 and 41 leaflets. And these leaflets do have a smooth edge. Um, and a kind of diagnostic trait of Tree of Heaven is if you crush up the leaves in your hand and you smell it, it will smell like burnt rubber. It has a very rancid aroma. You're probably saying, Becca, this looks a lot like sumac. How do I tell the difference? One way is that Tree of Heaven will turn yellow in the fall, where sumacs will turn red. And there's also another way to tell these, these leaves apart. Um, if you look at the bottom of the leaves, you'll see these little glandular nodes at the base of each leaflet. Um, and that is characteristic of Tree of Heaven, but you won't see that in our native sumacs or hickories. I would also say the smell. The smell is really distinctive. 
and they grow much taller. Definitely. So a uh, tree of heaven produces these small yellow green cluster flowers in late spring to early summer, um, which is very different also from sumac's, you know, red flowers, seeds. Um, tree of heaven does reproduce by seeds and they have these samaras. Um, so samaras are kind of how maples seeds are also in like little helicopters, but these are only single sided. They're one to two inches long. And they have this kind of pretty color, the dull orange or brown color. Um, the tree can retain them throughout the winter. So sometimes you'll see something like this where the leaves are gone off the tree, but the seeds are still there. Um, it's a pretty prolific seed producer. A single tree can produce up to 300,000 seeds. And as I mentioned before, it's not usually humans transporting these seeds, but the wind. So the wind can pick up these seeds and move them up to 300 feet. So 300 feet might not sound like much, but if you think of it in the context of a football field, these seeds can spread as far as a football field away. What's also kind of interesting is this tree can produce seeds very, very young. Um, a tree as young as two years old can produce seeds. The species will also reproduce via root suckers, so um, the roots will extend laterally and um, new clone trees can come up as far as 50 feet away from a parent tree. Um, and this is important to, to think about because a lot of these trees will sucker out like this if the parent tree is damaged. So if you found one of these and, and tried to lock it off in your own yard, you might just get 10 more suckers coming up. So um, it's, it's really important to know the best way to manage these. Um, this is a species that's very uncommon in the Adirondacks. So if you were to come across Tree of Heaven and see it, it's very important to report it to IMAP or report it to us. The other species that we talk about, um, those are great to report to IMAP, but they're pretty common in the front country in the Adirondacks and we do manage them, but not in as intensely as something like Tree of Heaven, which we want to keep from getting as widespread as those other species. Can I make a note, Becca? Of course. There, uh, so tree, I'm originally from New York City, and I'm not sure where folks are zooming in from, but if Tree of Heaven is super uncommon in the Adirondacks, this tree is everywhere downstate. Possibly Western New York as well, but I'm, Becca would be better expert at that than me, but every roadside, every block, every empty lot, every garden, tree of heaven all of like literally all of long island is tree of heaven so these are really really common in other parts of the state and we know that a lot of people come and visit the adirondacks so it's seeds that can come with folks um it's very common in albany um it can definitely travel so uh be aware of tree of heaven and then this will lead to the next issue of another important reason why to really be aware of this tree as Emily mentioned, this, this tree is pretty common in other parts of the state and those samaras are great at getting stuck like under your windshield wipers or if you had a canoe outside and you're bringing that with you and then you dump your, you know, you take the canoe off your car, you know, all things to think about as you're traveling around the state, you know, we want to minimize the spread of these species, not only, you know, from the front country to the back country, but at a broader geographical sense as well. So, um, this isn't a species we're going to talk a lot about, but the spotted lantern fly has recently been found in New York State. I'm sorry, I just saw the chat pop up. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so, spotted lantern fly was identified in New York State in August of 2020 um, on, on Staten Island. So, it's a relatively new invader into New York. Um, and this is kind of a, a scary species. Well, it primarily feeds on Tree of Heaven. Um, it does threaten our fruit and grape production in at least 25 native forest trees um, that are, are present. Um, like I said, we're not going to get into it a lot, but um, Emily will share some resources from our partners who have done some, some great outreach regarding the species. Emily, my chat seems to have disappeared. Would you mind reading that question from Tamara? Do you, if, if ash trees, or I think, Tamara, do you want to ask vocally? Sure, I can. 
So it's interesting as you were talking about tree of heaven, and it just made me start thinking if ash trees are going to start dying out because of emerald ash borer, I wonder, are you worried that tree of heaven might start invading in the place of ash trees since there will be new openings in the in our forests? Of course. I mean, uh, I did a little bit of research on emerald ash borer when I was in graduate school and we found that you know, if there was an invasive species present in the other story when we lost that ash tree, it was almost always an invasive species that filled, filled that gap that was created. Um, I know in other parts of the state, you know, it, that might be a, a great case study to look at. I know in the Rochester area, there's quite a few tree of heaven and we were kind of scoping out where it was in relation to the ash and seeing if it was going to be an invader. Um, Ash tends to be more of a wetland species than Tree of Heaven, but there's definitely that potential. So Tamara had a, a great segue, and actually our next species that we're going to talk about is the Emerald Ash Borer. We will then talk about the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, and then I will pass the baton back to Emily, and she's gonna talk a little bit about dumping worms. So the Emerald Ash Borer um, is, a invasive beetle and it can kill ash trees in as little as one to five years. Um, these guys are pretty small. They're generally range in size from three eighths to five inch of an, of an inch long and have a metallic green wings with this kind of beautiful copper body. Um, the biggest spread vector for this species is moving firewood. So when Emily was really harping on don't move firewood, I'm going to harp on it some more so we can keep this species out. Um, the first identified emerald ash borer case in the Adirondacks was reported this summer, and it seems to be fairly localized, so we'd like to keep it that way, and hopefully we can knock back the population and, and keep it out of the park a bit longer. Uh, and it's important to note, um, we're actually planning a seminar this winter on emerald ash borer, so please stay connected and we'll get you some information regarding this species seminar. So, Emerald ash borer, I think it's important to note when we talk about these invasive forest pests, how they're killing the trees. So emerald ash borer kills ash trees by larval feeding. So the larva will reside between the bark and the, the cambrium of the tree, and it will feed through all the vascular tissue, impairing the tree's ability to transport, you know, water and nutrients through, up and down through the tree. Um, and that Re, you know, cutting off the flow of nutrients would be the same as kind of, kind of cutting off our blood flow. Um, and that's why it can kill the, these trees so quickly. So here's a picture of me peeling off some bark and you can see all those larval galleries under the bark where the larva had eaten through the vascular tissue and, and it killed that tree essentially. And Becca, just going back to that slide one second, um, is that are those larval galleries what folks should be looking for when they're buying firewood? Oh, definitely. If, if you see larval galleries like this and you can identify the bark as ash, I, I wouldn't transport that. There are native um, pests in, in other tree species that would form a gallery like this that I wouldn't really be concerned about. Um, but, you know, that gets back to, you know, a lot of people, folks can't identify ash just based on bark alone. So, you know, buy your firewood as local as you can. You know, we talked about how we have our first identified case of emerald ash borer in the Adirondacks. If someone were to move firewood, you know, that was full of emerald ash borer, even 50 miles from that site, you know, that would have drastic impact. So, so buy your firewood as local as you can. So when I talk about emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid in a second, I'm going to go through how to identify the native host plants, just so that you kind of have an eye, a sense of what to look out for. So um, ash have compound leaves, and they generally have five to seven leaflets, as you can see in that upper left picture. Uh, they have seeds that are in, um, they're kind of paddle shaped, again, like, you know, the tree of heaven leaves, but they tend to be narrower and, and more of a green color. It does have an opposite branch pattern, which most trees tend to have an alternate branch pattern, so it's a great trait to look for. It's not the only species, but it's, there's definitely less with opposite than alternate, which you can see in that lower left picture. And it has this, the mature ash trees have a fairly diagnostic bark, so it has a deeply furrowed diamond shape. So if you 
really look at this tree and it, it takes looking at a few trees to get this down, but you can kind of start to pick out these really deeply furrowed di diamond shapes. Um, so when we're looking for emerald ash borer, the first thing we want to do is be able to identify an ash tree. So hopefully these can, can get you a little bit on your way. Now when we're looking for emerald ash borer, once we've identified our ash trees, the first thing I would look for is some canopy dieback. Canopy dieback typically begins in the upper one third of the tree and progresses downward. Um, just as the tree's um, ability to transport nutrients is impaired, it's usually the top branches that die back first. And the beetle tends to start by um, inhabiting the upper portions of the tree before moving down the stem. Uh, another thing I would look for, so if I saw a tree with some canopy dieback, I would look for what's known as blonding. And blonding is a form of woodpecker damage, and it's as the woodpeckers scrape away the bark looking for those larvae. Um, woodpeckers love to feed on these larvae. There's actually been studies that have shown that woodpecker populations will boom or increase drastically in areas with emerald ash borer. And once all the emerald ash borer have killed all the ash trees, then the emerald ash borer populations kind of fall back because there's no more trees for them to inhibit, the uh, woodpecker populations will bang out and decrease rapidly. So in addition to this blonding, that is, you know, a fairly early indicator of emerald ash borer, later in the disease, in the pest progression, we'll see deeper holes as the woodpeckers dig deeper and deeper into the tree looking for larvae. Another great thing I look for if I would see, you know, canopy die back, then blonding, are what are known as epicormic shoots. Because epicormic shoots are just kind of, um, I guess we could describe them as suckers that come out of the bark of the tree, usually at the lower levels. And these are re a result of the, um, the girdling, essentially, action of the pest. So once those vascular tissues are cut off and the tree can't, can't get the photosynthesates out of the leaves at the top of the tree, it will try to create these new branches to try to save itself. So it's get, trying to get branches close to the roots so that less of that vascular tissue is needed. Kind of more of a late emerald ash borer progression sign that you're going to look for is bark splitting. Um, once the tree starts to die, a lot of times the bark will split open and under those bark splits you'll see these S-shaped galleries. Um, these S-shaped or serpentine galleries are formed by larval feeding. Um, this is another picture actually right from the first site of emerald ash borer in the Adirondack Park. Um, these S-shaped galleries are, are very diagnostic of emerald ash borer. Um, you may need to peel back the bark to see them, or they may have those splits, you know, that we just talked about, where it'll be pretty obvious. Um, but they're, as you can see, they're very S-shaped and serpentine. And kind of, I think this is our final diagnostic trait for emerald ash borer. Um, when you're looking around, you'll see these these D-shaped exit holes, and these D-shaped exit holes are formed when the adult borers try it, you know, after they've gone through their larval phase and become adults as they bore out of the tree to fly and, and, and infest another tree, you'll get these D-shaped exit holes that are fairly diagnostic. Um, these D-shaped exit holes are about the size of a pencil. Um, and that, that's kind of the size we're looking for. And there are native pests that will form a hole that size, but it'll typically be more rounded as opposed to D-shaped. So the next species we're going to talk about is the Hemlockwood adelgid. And as folks have probably heard, we have a uh, infestation of Hemlockwood adelgid down in the Lake Air George area that we are investigating right now. Much like emerald ash borer, we will be having another workshop uh, exclusively on the species this winter, so please stay connected. So um, Hemlockwood adelgids are, are tiny, tiny guys. They're about 1.5 millimeters long, and they're a sap-sucking insect. These guys take a little bit longer to kill their host trees than emerald ash borer. It's about four to 10 years. Um, and uh, these guys are spread via birds. So um, there's not much we can do to help slow their spread, you know, as, as far as hikers and bikers, but it's great to, for folks to be keeping a lookout. And if you see the signs of Black Willie Adelgid, please, please, please report it to us and report it to DPC so we can, we can go out there and confirm it and, and try to treat these sites. Bear with me a second as I try to get this slide to advance. There we go. So, oh, I think I went too far. So, are okay. they carried as a mite on birds, Becca, then? 
so these little crawlers that you can see in this picture here, those guys will get on birds during their crawler phase. It's part of their life cycle and the birds will spread them around. And unfortunately, you know, birds can fly pretty far so they can spread pretty far that way. And it's not that we want to control birds, but if people are on the lookout, trees can be treated by foresters. So I just want to put that out there for people if they feel hopeless right now from what Becca just mentioned. So I'm going to let you keep going, Becca. But yes. being on the lookout for these, this evidence is important. So as we're talking about these invasive pests, I'm going to just chat about how they kill their host trees. So for hemlock whale adelgid, we have juvenile hemlock whale adelgids known as crawlers. And you can see these little itty bitty guys that are kind of a rusty red color in the picture. We got a little arrow pointing to one. They actually use their, their little tiny mouth parts and insert them into the base of the needles. So this is a pretty magnified picture, but this right here is a needle and you can see another needle here. And they will actually feed on the tree's stored starches. And as the tree tries to heal off and stem that flow of nutrients out of itself, it will just kind of seal off that whole needle and the whole needle will die off. And over time that results in the death of the tree. So how do we identify hemlock? Uh, so hemlock is a conifer, so it has evergreen leaves. Um, they're short and they're about half an inch long. And the number one thing, way to identify a hemlock from kind of our other native conifers is that its needles are flat. So if you can go up and, and feel the needles, they're, they're pretty flat and they are in, arranged on a branch singly. So not like a pine where you might have a little bunch of needles. Another thing I look for aside from that, that flatness is that hemlock needles tend to have these white stripes on the bottom, which you can see in the left picture. The bark for the species, you know, it's not super diagnostic, but you know, over time you can train your eye and uh, hemlocks have brown, thick, deeply furrowed bark that you can see on the right side of this slide. So there's a few things to look for when we're looking for hemlock wood adelgid out in the field. Not, as, not nearly as many as emerald ash borer. The first thing I would look for is needle loss and branch dieback. So we kind of have that insert of those two photos at the top. The tree on the left clearly has no needles left. And the tree on the right has you know, some needle loss going on and obviously a yellowing or graying of the needles. And we have kind of this zoomed in background picture showing you that as well. So if you see, these kind of yellowing gray needles and needle dieback, that's kind of your first sign that something's going on. The other kind of more diagnostic of hemlock oil adelgid, you know, hemlock trees can decline for, for natural reasons as well, um, is what these white woolly ova sacs um, on the, the base of the needles where they attach to the branches on hemlock trees. So these white woolly masses are about the quarter of the size of a cotton swab, and they are found on the underside of the branches at the base of the needles. Um, these are formed during um, the later life stages of the hemlock wood adelgid. Um, their bodies produce kind of a waxy secretion, and that's what forms here as they're, they're feeding on those needles. Um, these white woolly masses are typically most visible from November until uh, late April. So if you're out walking and snowshoeing in the winter and you see these white woolly masses, we would love, love, love to hear about it. Um, Emily actually was nice enough to include uh, where we have confirmed hemlock woolly adelgid cases in New York State by town map. So you can see kind of how they're encroaching from the south end of the park and, and where the species is coming from. Um, you may still see these woolly masses at this time of year, but they're oftentimes washed off by rain by now but in a heavy infestation, they would still be present. So something to keep an eye out for. Um, actually, snowshoeing is a great segue to, or a great point, Becca, because this upcoming, and please stay involved in, in our follow-up, please get on our listserv because we're gonna be having a lot of different workshops coming up this winter, um, where, and one in particular in, late February where we'll be hosting, APIP will be hosting a Hemlock Woolly Adelgid workshop um, and we'll be partnering with the Adirondack Mountain Club and so they'll be hosting um, snowshoeing trips after in early March in order to go out and look and survey 
for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid outside of the, the area in Lake George where they were identified this past summer. So it's been a hard summer for invasive forest pests, um, but, but we won't stop there and I'll tell you about one more until we move on. Um, and that is um, not an insect, but an annelid and an invertebrate. Um, and that is invasive jumping worms. So invasive jumping worms are also kind of new to the Adirondack region, but quite prevalent in the Hudson Valley in particular, in the Southern Hudson Valley. So Dutchess County, Westchester County, um, getting up into Ulster County um, and outside of Albany, um, and then prevalent in Western New York and other parts of Vermont and New Hampshire as well. And some of our first sightings have happened in the Adirondacks. That being said, um, they could be present and people are not using reporting mechanisms like IMAP Invasive to help us manage our management tools. So if we have more citizen scientists out there trained to know what to look for, trained, know how to use IMAP, which is actually a pretty easy um, app and it's all free and it doesn't use data. Um, it's like iNaturalist, I'll get into it in a minute, but um, it could be present. Um, and these are particularly creepy crawlers. Um, we'll go into that in just a second. So invasive jumping worms were introduced in 2013 to Wisconsin um, from Japan and Korea where they're native. Um, they were introduced via potting soil um, at different nurseries. So there's a lot of plant trade globally, internationally, and across the country. And these, in, these annelids, the worms, and their egg sacs, so I mentioned their eggs, quite a few times talking about keeping your boots and your bikes and your pets clean. Um, their eggs can live for quite some time and they're often in compost or potting soil um, or on your shoes. So especially if you're coming from the Hudson Valley. Um, on app, they're about the same size as a typical earthworm, though I know night crawlers can be huge. Um, and then if you ever do any at-home composting with worms, red wigglers are quite small. Um, I'd say these are average size earthworms, about four to five inches in length. Um, the impact that they make to the ecosystem that you would see is that the, they're voracious eaters. And so, you know, often you'll see little piles of, egg, of worm castings here and there where earthworms have made their hole down into the soil, but the, what our partner has described to me, who's worked with them quite a bit in Dutchess County, is that they turn the soil structure from, you know, something more typical, something with structure, something that you could slice into like a cake and serve, to more like a mushy ground beef-like substance. Um, when that happens, plants can no longer hold on to anything. The peat, and so they can fall over in, in harsh winds. You, you could also have trees toppling over where they haven't before, where the soil's really impacted. Um, especially say if we had a hurricane, another Hurricane Irene come up the Hudson Valley and have intense winds and you have these worms destroying soil structure, you could have a lot of damage. Um, they change the pH of the soil and so a lot of plants won't have the correct pH in order to uptake nutrients that they need they can over nutrient or put too many nutrients or eutrophy the soil so that seeds cannot germinate. A lot of native plants are pretty sensitive in terms of nutrients they need, structure that they need, because that structure also has oxygen in it um, because there's little pockets and holes in the structure. Um, and so it's, it's making a really um, inhospitable, inhospitable environment to really sensitive native plants such as say, orchids or ramps or trilliums that are really, really sensitive spring ephemerals. You're gonna find them in the top two to four inches of soil, not deeper down. And primarily you'll find them in the duff. So they're also, as I said, they're voracious eaters, but they're also taking up all of that leaf litter that slowly decomposes and puts nutrients back into a system for a diverse uh, plant community to take up on its own time. Um, you're never going to find them individually. You're going to find a mass of them, which is uh, horrifying enough to make sure that your boots are always clean. Um, I don't want to find worm masses anywhere, personally, and I love worms. Um, 
we had a really great detailed workshop on on these invasive jumping worms just a few weeks ago that I'll share out with folks. And since we're running out of time, I don't want to go in too deeply, but there's a few more identifying characteristics. Um, and I will share that out with you. So one of the top ways to identify and compare an invasive jumping worm to say a common earthworm is this band. Um, it's very important to pay attention to the location of this band along the worm's body. On an invasive jumping worm, the clitellum, which is that band, um, which is where worms make their little egg sacs, and they're very important, um, it's much, much closer to the end of the worm, the head of the worm, than say uh, a European earthworm or a night crawler. That clitellum is much further back on the worm. So when an earthworm moves backwards and forwards, it stretches out, and you're going to see that the clitellum is much further back. Um, the clitellum on an invasive jumping worm is also smooth and in line with the rest of the worm, whereas on a European earthworm, um, it's going to be a little bump, a little raised. So if you're touching the worms and you realize that it's very smooth and it's, it's not raised above the rest of the worm's body, it might be an invasive jumping worm. It's also bright, a very bright white versus more of a brown, um, so it really pops out at you. Couple other differences um, regarding color. This is not the best example of it, where I think this is maybe more um, demonstrative of the color of the invasive worm. They're a little bluish. They're a little metallic. Um, this is a little more gray or a little more brown, um, but they really are a little metallic, a really shiny. And the biggest indicator of if you found invasive jumping worms. So you're gonna find in the top two to four inches of soil, their clitellum is different. It's smooth, it's bright, and it's close to the head. Um, you're never gonna find a worm alone. They're gonna be with their friends. And really what gives it its name, and I'm gonna click this uh, nightmarish YouTube video right now. We're gonna just watch a snippet of it. This should inspire you to always clean your boots and your bike and your pet and not introduce these worms into the Adirondacks or anywhere, because um, they jump, they move really fast, and this video is not sped up. That's enough of that. Um, I hope, did that, did that video play for other folks? Becca, did that work? Okay, great. Um, so we're running, we're running really low on time um, and we have a really great workshop that I'm gonna send out to folks. Yuck, very yuck, very creepy, crawly critters. And I love all animals, but not, not that one. Um, I will send a link to the longer workshop we had with the Cornell Cooperative Extension Dutchess County as part of the follow-up for this and a number of other things. So please pay attention um, to your inbox. Um, and speaking of your inbox, our next, oh, oh no, they're back. Oh no. Um, I sent out, so we're gonna just take five minutes to talk about IMAP invasives. Um, and I sent information in your email and the reminder email for this workshop, but I'll send it out again, because now you know it's so important to use IMAP invasive so that you can tell Emily and Becca where all these invasive species are so that we can employ rapid response in order to control their populations. So we talked a bit about what to look for. Talked about, we're learning our plants. We talked about ways to prevent the spread, biking and hiking and pet ownership and parking. Um, and now we're just going to talk a little bit about how to report sightings. So what is this IMAP invasives that Emily keeps going on and on and on about? It is a nonprofit app and web software, mapping software that is used by different organizations to track the presence, spread, and distribution of different in top tier invasive species in their area. Um, in my previous work out in Oregon, we used it. Um, we use it here in New York. 
um, Central North Canada uses it, Florida, the Southwest. So it's similar to IMAP, or iNaturalist, but it's more real-time data and it is run, it's all free. It's free to download, it's free to use. You don't have to use data and real scientists are using it and real land managers are using it in order to understand what their job is, right? We're only a few people managing 6 million acres of Adirondack Park. Um, and without the help and service of uh, outdoor enthusiasts and citizen scientists like yourselves, our, our job could be literally impossible. We also have a really great training we did back on, I believe July 1st with the folks who run IMAP Invasives. And they're stationed out of the SUNY Environmental School of Forestry. They're really excellent, brilliant folks. Um, and I'll send a link to a bigger training that we hosted with them so that people can just go through how to set up an account, go through how to put, um, upload um, their findings. And we'll jump into that for just a minute or two now. Um, so I sent you information on how to get to the website and how to make an account. I've requested, um, I sent you all the info you need to put in what project you're working under. It's not necessary to choose an organization. Um, that's for more behind the scenes info, but just for the general idea of how it works. Um, you're out in the universe, you're out hiking, and you see purple loosestrife in the back country. You've got your account set up on your app. Open up my app. And you have to report it because otherwise Becca and Emily won't know it's there and we don't want it to spread. We don't want it to get out of control. And so I've already set up my, my account. I've set my geography to New York. I've set up my list of species because Emily sent me a list of species to pop in there and to populate it. Um, and so really you're taking a photo with your camera. You're indicating what species it is. Um, you're selecting that it's detected because you saw it there. You saw jumping worms, so you've detected it. And you select what date that you detected it on. Now, while you're out in the back country or you're canoeing or you're hiking or whatever, or you're biking, you don't have to upload this right away. You can wait till you get home to Wi-Fi, which is what makes it so easy. Um, this goes into entering your findings. So you select your species, say it's detected, you see what project it's working under. You took a really awesome photo. This is an example of a, maybe not the best photo. So real people are gonna look at this. So if you saw invasive jumping worms, try to take a good photo. Um, and then you can upload it. You can upload your selections and you can, and as soon as we get these, as soon as you upload them, we get notifications that they're there. Um, so I know that that was a really, really fast, uh, not detailed introduction to IMAP invasives and using the app whatsoever. Um, but tonight we wanted to talk to you more about best practices with hiking and biking. And I'm gonna send you information on, on this past workshop that we have recorded and you can jump in right there. We're also always available to ask questions, to talk on the phone. We can connect you to the user folks or the the service providers at IMAP Invasives and they can walk you through how to download it onto your phone and how to set up an account. Um, our goal is to make it really easy for you. And so just to review, in summary, there's a lot you can do to protect the Adirondack Park while you're recreating this fall. Keep your boots clean, use a boot brush station, carry a boot brush, keep your pets clean, keep them on the trail, keep your bike clean, keep your bike on the trail, don't bike in mud, when you're hiking and biking, don't make new trails, don't widen trails. If you keep a mask on you, you won't have to avoid, you know, stepping off the trails to let other people pass. So if everybody's operating in a safe, respectful manner of each other and the trail, um, we can all stay safe out there. Learn your plants. So I'm also gonna send everybody a plant guide that APIP has published, a free PDF. If, you have, if you're on this call and you happen to work with a school or a 4-H group or Girl Scouts or a library. Um, we also might have an ability to mail you physical copies of these plant guides. We don't have too many people on the call tonight, so that would be pretty easy for me. Um, if there were 1,500 of you, that would be impossible, but I can help you get the resources you need to learn your plants. 
download IMAP invasives and I will send you links to that as well. And please, please, please don't move firewood. Um, it is now 7.03. We were only gonna go till seven, but I'm happy to stay and answer any questions that folks may have. Um, we'd love for you to stay in touch. And so I'll also send you a link to our listserv to get um, connected uh, also through our Facebook and our Instagram and our listservs so that you can be aware of all of our upcoming workshops that are gonna be really fun. So without any further ado, I'm here to answer questions. And I wanna thank Becca so much. And I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. You can go off mute. You can ask a question with your voice. It's okay if you don't have questions. Oh, we have a chat. We have a question. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us, Tamara. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Oh, you're welcome. Amanda, please, oh, we will email out the plant guides. Oh, definitely a PDF, but if you're with a group, I have a few hundred copies to, to send to groups who will use them. We're all also on a limited budget, so. <laughs> Times are tough. Oh, here's a good question from Mary Becca. If we see purple loose stripe, is it good to break off the flowering heads? Yeah, so if you're out hiking and, or even, you know, you have some purple loose stripe on your property, it's great to, to break off that, that flower head, you know, preferably before it goes to seed. Um, and the best way to dispose of that is to put it in a black contractor bag and leave it in the sun for two weeks and that will solarize and destroy the plant material. And then you can just, just you know, get rid of that, that bag with the seed heads via the normal trash stream, whether you know you have curbside up or you're taking it to a transfer station. It's the lesser of two evils. Don't compost top tier invasive plants. That's a good, if you're a compost fanatic like myself, it gets hard to do that, but it's important to do. If, if it is going to seed, they dry out and become these dry, uh, tall spikes with little capsules throughout. Um, if they haven't dropped their seeds, you can always throw a paper bag over it and crack it off, make sure you flip it right away so it doesn't just spill its seeds everywhere. Um, but that would have to be for maybe a small patch. If you have a lot of purple loose strife, it depends. But you can also snap pictures and email us um, that we're here to help. And then other Mary, Mary Ann has a really great question. Um, do I actually need to wash my canoe when I leave a body of water, no propeller? The answer is yes. Clean, drain, dry your boat. Clean, drain, dry your paddles and uh, your life vests as well. So a propeller, that's a really good distinction though. So a propeller will often hold water inside of it and a bigger boat, like a motorboat, will hold water inside of it until you bail it out. But your canoe will as well, at least the way I paddle, which is very messily, you can get water in your canoe. And if there are invasive in invertebrates, like snails um, or um, different types of zooplankton, you might, not, you, you might not see anything. It might be totally invisible to the, to the naked eye. And so if there's water present in your boat, um, it's, it's possible that there are invasive invertebrates. Um, if there's plants, you will most likely see it, um, but it's just really good practice and to stay safe and clean your canoe um, after you go paddling because we have different species living in different lakes throughout the Adirondacks. Like I live near Taylor Pond, which is horribly infested with milfoil, um, but the next pond over, Silver Lake Pond, or Silver Lake, has no milfoil because people are clean, drain, and drying their boats. But I know, it's hard. Milfoil is the worst. And jumping worms. They're all the worst. Um, but it's, it's hard when we don't have enough um, boat wash stations, but I just hose mine off at home um, and leave it out in next to the house in the sun, turned over. Great. 
Thank you, Amanda. That is really great info. And we're really glad you're a boat steward. Awesome. This is, these are great questions. Um, we're here to answer, we're, we're here, it's literally my job to answer your questions all the time. So I will, you know, feel free to email me. Um, if you also work with another group, like a garden club or something like that, we can also, if depending on our schedules, we might even be able to help give a talk to your group or a canoe club. Um, I don't know if there are canoe clubs up here, but there are down in the city in Brooklyn, where I am from. Um, great. Well, if I don't see any more questions, I think we might say good night. And I want to thank you all for hanging in there and joining us. And now it's the middle of the night. Soon it'll be like this at 2 p.m. Okay. So thank you, Becca. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn off the recording. <laughs>